Welcome to the second annual Young Adult Series. Uh, we're all very glad that you could join. Uh, like last year, we have amazing speakers lined up, uh, lots of opportunities to ask questions and connect with each other. And of course, we're uh, deeply grateful for the Legrelli family for sponsoring the event into its second year. Uh, and we'll be hearing from them in just a bit. Uh, for now, uh, in the meantime, I'm, uh, I should introduce myself. I'm Peter Dobronowski. It's uh, a huge pleasure to be able to moderate uh, the first three nights of this year's series. Uh, for those that might remember me from last year, I'm an IBD patient, volunteer, and researcher. Uh, I've been volunteering with Crohn's and Colitis Canada for almost nine years in lots of roles. Uh, I got a master's degree studying Crohn's disease, and now I'm working on a PhD studying new treatments for IBD. So like many of you, uh, I was diagnosed back when I was younger, uh, in a, I was a teenager, uh, which made transitioning into adulthood uh, a different kind of journey thanks to a series of flare-ups. Uh, at that time, uh, I didn't know anybody else with IBD or much about it. And frankly, I needed something like this. So I'm really happy that you all have this opportunity. And I'm really looking forward to getting to meet some of you uh, during the, the breakout sessions later today. Uh, okay, with that, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce, oh, uh, okay, sorry, I will uh, plug uh, the next uh, few sessions first. Um, so September 22nd, we will be featuring a uh, Canadian Olympian, John Smith, uh, who will be giving a uh, presentation and answering questions, uh, as well as the 29th, uh, we've uh, invited Dr. Leslie Graff and uh, one of our uh, young adults um, uh, that helped put this uh, event together, uh, Martha, who will be um, answering questions and giving the presentation. And then on October 6th, uh, we'll be inviting Dr. Natasha Haskey, uh, who's a registered dietitian and doing some great research in the, the realm of microbiome and IBD, as well as Dr. Sarah Kahut, who's an outstanding um, uh, clinical psychologist, uh, who's, uh, who's uh, great to hear from. And then Dr. Catherine Krause and uh, Krista, uh, I cannot pronounce her name, uh, Usu, sorry, and Shannon Epstein. Um, okay. So with that, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Crohn's and Colitis Canada's CEO and President, Laurie Radke. Hi, Laurie. Thanks, Peter. Hi, everyone. Um, and thank you for joining us for this second annual Young Adult Series. Um, thank you, Peter, for, for sharing a bit about yourself and a bit of your story. That's great. Um, and well wishes to those of you who are observing Yom Kippur this evening. Um, we're going to talk a little bit, I want to remind everyone about the mission of Crohn's and Colitis Canada. Our mission and our promise, as we call it, is to cure Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis and improve the lives of children and adults affected by these chronic diseases. And tonight's event, as you've heard, includes a welcome social and a session with Dr. Nancy Fu from the University of British Columbia and Austin Hawes, who will both speak to transitions in care, what to expect, advice on seeking accommodations in work and school, and becoming more autonomous and independent in taking care of your health. And as Peter mentioned, our Young Adult Series is generously supported by the Legrelli Family Foundation. So thank you to Anne and David Legrelli. And at this point in time, I'd like to introduce Anne to say a few words. Hi there, how are you guys? It's very nice to be here tonight. I uh, really am truly delighted to be here to welcome you to the second annual Young Adult Series, which is organized obviously by Crohn's and Colitis Canada. My name is Anne Legrelli, and I'm here beha tonight on behalf of our family and the Legrelli Family Foundation. We are so proud to support these important sessions and discussions, which really do focus on the needs of young adults experiencing IBD. Most importantly, we are involved in this initiative because of our son and our brother, and my two other children were unable to join us this evening, uh, Richard Legrelli. Richie, whose photograph I hope you can see on the screen, was diagnosed with ulcerative colitis at the age of 18. 
while he struggled with his diagnosis initially and suffered so many of the issues that many of you may also have confronted. Anxiety, social isolation, persistent reoccurring affections, dietary and nutritional risks, you, you know all of the, the long list of possibilities. But Richie, as you can see from this photograph, always maintained a positive and hopeful attitude. After some time, he developed strategies that allowed him to thrive despite his condition. He developed a ferocious strength combined with a wonderful witty demeanor. He also became more involved in Crohn's and Colitis Canada and found the neighborhood support groups that he participated in extremely helpful. He realized he was not alone and he appreciated hearing about other people's experience with IBD. Ultimately, Richie graduated from university and worked in the sports industry in a number of capacities uh, over the years uh, subsequently. Having worked at Tennis Canada, he would have been so proud of our incredible young athletes at the recent US Open. So that was always very important to him. Unfortunately, Richie was diagnosed with an extremely rare form of bile duct cancer at the age of 26. And after 11 weeks, he died at home with all of us by his side. While the grief is less acute, and now after, now after three years, it always remains with us. However, now we find ourselves being better able to remember and cherish the wonderful memories that we have of our gentle, kind, loving, and funny son, brother, cousin, and friend to many. We continue to actively support the Princess Margaret Cancer Foundation through Richie's Riders and the Ride to Conquer Cancer, and have been working hard to raise money to support several important research projects focused on young adults with IBD. Richie specifically asked that some of his money be dedicated to helping other young adults who were experiencing IBD. He felt the best avenue was to promote open dialogue, opportunities to get to know others, which unfortunately have been somewhat curtailed by the pandemic, and to keep up to date with emerging trends and options that may become available to young adults such as yourselves. He did believe that while any form of IBD is hard to deal with at any time, at every age, it is particularly challenging for those like yourselves who have your whole lives ahead of you. You have educational and personal goals to meet, and critically, you need to be able to find ways in which you receive the kinds of support that will assist you most effectively as you go through this journey. And as Richie also believed strongly to remember the importance of individual self-worth and hope. Over the next four weeks, you will have the opportunity to share experiences with your peers, to learn about the supports provided by Crohn's and Colitis Canada, and to hear from many clinical leaders in the field of IBD. We are particularly excited by the discussion tonight on the challenges associated with transitioning from pediatric IBD care to the cumbersome and sometimes frustrating adult healthcare system. As a healthcare consultant myself, my colleagues and I have frequently come across this issue in a number of projects. Um, it has related to several complex chronic conditions, such as cystic fibrosis, diabetes, obviously IBD, and numerous mental health concerns. I commend Crohn's and Colitis Canada and the advisory panel for recognizing the importance of this, as it can be very challenging to navigate a different care model, a diff different people that you don't know as well, and a new team that you have not had the opportunity to establish the kinds of relationships that you might have within the pediatric world. I also know that Dr. Fu will be provide you with many thoughtful suggestions for your consideration and thought. Crohn's and Colitis Canada has pulled together an impressive list of other speakers from John Smythe, a member of the Canadian men's national field hockey team, Dr. Leslie Graff, who will focus on the mental health issues, or some of them, 
and many other experts who bring their incredible knowledge and experience to these sessions. I hope you make the most of them. That being said, I sincerely hope that the peer support groups and the virtual socials that have been organized will bring many of you together to be supportive of each other, to laugh, to share experiences, and maybe cry a little. But most importantly, to allow you all to recognize the richness of your shared experience. So in closing, on behalf of our family, and most importantly, on behalf of Richard Adam Legrelli, we wish you all the best and hope that you enjoy and learn from these next four week sessions. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Anne, for the, the beautiful words and the, the powerful introduction. Uh, speaking on behalf of everybody, we're, we're very grateful for this opportunity to connect and learn, and it means a, a lot to have your support. So thank you again. Um, so uh, now before we, we get started uh, with the, uh, the social activities, I'd just like to give a, an outline of uh, what this evening will look like. Um, uh, we're going to, uh, I think, come together as, as a group um, uh, rather than breaking out into to smaller groups um, where we'll go through a series of different activities. The first will be sort of a, uh, a general introduction. Uh, we'll uh, talk about why we're here, what we're hoping to get out of it, a little bit about our story, and then we'll have a couple of activities uh, uh, that are more fun and, and engaging, uh, and that will be happening shortly. Uh, so that will take us until about 7.50. We'll take a short break for about 10 minutes and then come back at 8 p.m. Uh, Eastern time uh, where we'll begin the presentations. So first we'll be by a, uh, an expert in the field, a uh, uh, gastroenterologist, Dr. Nazi Fu, as well as uh, a young adult uh, advocate, uh, Austin Hogg. Um, and then I'll wrap up uh, at around 9 p.m. Thank you for uh, having me here. And um, this is meant to be quite informal. My presentation is relatively short. So um, I'm going to share my screen and I think I'm gonna save most of the time later on in Q&A so we can kind of discuss what are important for you. Okay, so here we go. Um, I hope you can see my screen. Here we go. So um, thank you for the introduction. In this uh, section, we're going to focus on um, adult GI's pers perspective in transition to adult care. Um, so what we're going to cover in the next 10, 15 minutes is go over what is transition? Why is it important? You know, what is different in adult centers? What are expected of you and what you should be expected of me and how can you prepare yourself when moving from pediatric to adult center. And I, I, I hope most of you um, are in the process or are still perhaps are going into adult centers or um, perhaps attending uh, university um, as well. So um, the difference between transition and transfer. Um, so transition is actually a purposeful plan event for young adults moving from child-centered child -centered to adult-oriented healthcare system. So moving from children's hospital to one of um, adult, like, adult GIs like us. It is a supposedly to be an uninterrupted, coordinated and matched to the developmental ability of the individual going through. Um, the transfer is where uh, the, our pediatric colleague hand over your care over to the adult system. It is part of the transition, it's definitely not the end of the transition because as some of you might know, once you move over to the adult care, there are still a lot of things to learn and to adjust. So what are the key aspects that we're looking for during the time of transitions? Are our young adults able to have abstract thinking? Are they thinking about their future, how mature they are? And this is for our pediatric colleague to decide, okay, well, is this person ready to be transitioned and move over to adult care? Um, what's the good, what is a good time for transferring is when your disease is stable, your social, um, so for example, school, your uh, environment, your family is stable, that's the best time to move over to adult system, okay? Now, 
what happens if things didn't go well? Um, this is what has been shown in literature that some um, some of the adult, uh, some of the young adults may be lost to GI follow up, and this means that they will have they they have no one to really look after their disease. Uh, this then lead to increased hospitalization, so showing up to the hospital, missing clinic attendance, and then going to emergency department more often um, in that period. Um, and all of that also uh, would be related to perhaps you're not that, un that um, understanding the importance of medical therapy for you. So you're not adhering to therapy, um, you know, not understanding your disease that well. And then you become uh, perhaps skeptical and a little bit ambivalent uh, to, you know, your treatments or disease and um, trying to perhaps, um, uh, and then to be honest, during that period of time, a lot of young adults are busy. And so there are a lot of things happening. And this focusing on Crohn's and colitis may not be your top priority. And that's totally understandable. Okay, so this section is really for you to know the difference between pediatric and adult and how we can best prepare you moving forward. So as you know, and perhaps familiar with is the pediatric, uh, our pediatric colleagues, their practice are very family oriented. So um, your parents are often in the examination room in the meeting with the gastroenterologist together with you. It is a lot of multidisciplinary approach. So there often will be a nurse, uh, sometimes social worker, uh, and then you'll be connected to other support, uh, such as psychologists, uh, so, um, you know, psychiatrists, um, in, in that sense. It is usually occurring in a tertiary center, so a larger center like sick kids, you know, BC Children's Hospital. Um, the appointments are way a lot longer. So often you're there for half an hour, 45 minutes, sometimes even up to an hour. In the beginning of your disease course, parent, often the parents will be making your making decisions regarding treatments, therapy for you. And then um, because of this, a lot of times uh, patients may not be all that engaged in kind of learning about Crohn's, learning about colitis, and learning about the medications. This is a little bit different on the adult side. So as an adult gastroenterologist, I'm often under assumptions that my patients have some knowledge and have good information about their condition because they're vastly um, uh, invested in their own health. And so in that situation, uh, our meetings are a lot, a lot of times um, only with you, uh, not often parents are there. It's all often only talking about your disease. Um, and it's led by the consultants. And so um, you will see your GI, and then there may be limited uh, access to other supported care, such as a colleges, dietitian, uh, even IBD nurse. <clears throat> This is usually done in local clinic, so various clinics throughout the province, um, and then sometimes in hospital. It's very short, often half an hour, sometimes even 15 minutes, uh, you're in and out of the clinic. Uh, we we're, we're have some expectations of how much you know about the disease, and you should, and often we expect you to kind of have some understanding about the therapy itself. We, um, would expect you to make decisions for yourself but it is hard and that's why we have you know young adult specific young adult clinic where we are uh, hoping to do a mixture of both sort of pediatric um, uh, style of a clinic and an adult style of clinic now um, the focus of uh, a lot of discussion may be different as well so in terms of um, our pediatric colleagues, they are worried about, uh, when you're diagnosed young, they're worried about your growth, your uh, puberal delay. And then they do they are a lot more um, involved in helping you with psychosocial stress, such as you know, depression, anxiety, your self-esteem. And sometimes at that period of time when the disease are very, very, very severe, and it's not a surprise that, you know, we, some people might walk away and that's, uh, that's you know, sometimes avoid and coping. So don't want to think about your condition. And there is concerns also with suicide. 
no, the lifestyle in younger adults uh, may be different uh, compared to uh, adults in their 30s and 40s uh, because their lifestyle, they are growing and they're, uh, you know, um, entering their uh, adulthood. So they're thinking about sexuality, thinking about experimenting, you know, drug or alcohol, school is different, so moving on to university, moving on to secondary um, uh, educations, and then at the same juncture, thinking about when, you know, employment. As for adult GI, so when you are, when we are treating adults, growth and, pu you know, pubertal delay is not in our mind that much. We're thinking about complications of disease and complications of long-standing history of Crohn's and colitis. So for example, drug use that you have, you know, osteoporosis or cancer, um, need for surgeries. And then <clears throat> we help our uh, patients navigate through disease-related stress and that the, the, the disease-related psychosocial stress. Often, and this is pretty bad for us as an adult GI, is that we don't go into details and uh, ask patients that much about anxiety, depressions, and other <clears throat> their psychosocial aspect. And in terms of patients that we see, their focus in their life may be a bit different as well. They talk about, you know, family planning, uh, contraceptions, uh, and then we talk about career, uh, parenting, and you know, smoking cessation. So. The, the focus of our practices, practices may be different. Now, in terms of common barriers and what we usually see, you know, what may impact the proper transition that can go from, you know, here I showed you the different aspects of the uh, key player. So for our pediatric colleague, because they have been, you know, looking after you for a long time, they might be reluctant to uh, relinquish care, letting you move over to the adult care. And what then might uh, be problem also for our us as a receiving adult, we might not be getting enough information from our pediatric colleague. There can be poor coordination uh, between moving over from one center to another. And perhaps there, that's, that's happening in both of uh, adult and GI is that there is no specific training to how to properly transition young adult uh, from to, from a pediatric to adult center. And um, for most of uh, young adults, um, you know, it's scary to leave a familiar environment and you know, a uh, good relationship with your pediatric GI to a completely new settings and seeing a new doctor. Um, sometimes you may not be interested in taking on the responsibilities, you know, filling prescription, calling your doc, uh, looking after, you know, taking the medication. And that varies from, you know, different young adults, but that is something that we see as well. Um, you know, maturity. So are you able to think, okay, well, how is this not having uh, disease under control affect me? Um, and how are psychosocial, so your, uh, you know, social environment, family, your friends, your school, it impact you, how do you manage stress? How can you properly communicate with, you know, um, adult GI? And then um, you have no information uh, about where you're going and who you're going to see. And that's probably the most scary part for a lot of uh, patients that we hear and a lot of patients that we talk, that we that we met is that, you know, I'm being told that I'm going to be sent to an adult GI, but I have no clue who I'm seeing. Um, and and that's, that's what we're hoping to change in the future. Now, as for parents, um, and transition is, transition also involves your parents, for sure. Um, as the parents, is they are uh, reluctant to relinquish the primary care role. So they, they've been looking after you for such a long time, hard for them to, you know, let you, uh, look after yourself and they are uh, they have always been worrying so come that will usually continue um also we see her, her you know helicopter parenting which means they will constantly hover over you hover over medical uh doctors and the nurses and and that's something that we see on parents as well and for adult gi me um I have interest in young adult transition, but not all my colleagues do. Uh, many of my colleagues uh, find, you know, complicated uh, IBD patients from the pediatric center difficult to manage. Uh, and we, we, 
have other patients that are easier to manage. So this may not be everyone's interest. And, and in that case, that may not be everyone's have good knowledge about this. We don't have skills and training um, embedded in our uh, medical training for how to transition people properly. And to be honest, a lot of a lot of us are working in silo. So we work in our clinic, go to the hospital for endoscopy. Many of us don't have IB nurses. Many of us lack connections to other specialties that we can support you through. And so these are barriers for properly transitioning you to from the pediatric to adult center. Now, <clears throat> what are most of the adult GIs uh, expect from young adults is that we hope you are uh, proactive. Communications, communication is the most important thing because once we know what's happening to you, we can react and we can help you along. So be a reactive, uh, be proactive. Tell us what's happening. Tell us if there's any changes. And let us know how to best reach you. Um, I'm not saying you need to come into clinic. Let us know. Can you be reached by text? Should I call you? Should I email you? Um, and you know that keep the uh, <clears throat> channel of communication open. Ask questions. And we're always happy to answer uh, questions um, uh, for you. And then uh, in terms of medical systems uh, is that uh, you know, have a family doctor because uh, although our pediatric colleagues are tend to have uh, take over some of the primary care physicians' uh, uh, job, and you know, a lot of times communicating communicating with pediatricians. Once you move over move over to the adult system, unfortunately, you cannot be followed by a pediatrician anymore. And adult GI, we are actually not comfortable managing some primary care uh, issues. And so definitely have a family doctor will be most important. Learn about IBD. Uh, you know, uh, we're happy to provide resources uh, for you to know about what IBD is, uh, therapy, and then know about you yourself, how your disease is, how was it diagnosed, the history, what therapy have you gone through, whether you have, have surgery. Know your flare symptom, and that's really important because once you know your flare symptoms, that is the time. If you notice any changes, go back as the first point, communicate to your adult GI. And um, monitoring. So a lot of times we cannot do scope and we cannot see you all the time right away. Uh, we, um, and as I said, many of us don't have nurses support, so we may not get back to you right away. But one way that we can keep tap on you and making sure that you're doing well is um, some of the tests. So blood tests, stool tests, and occasionally endoscopy. That's how we kind of break up the time point so that we know that you are actually doing well. Now, in terms of life in general, um, I'm very interested in knowing what's happening to you. So any stressors, are you moving? Uh, are you going to schools? Are you going to school in a different province? Because that's important, and as time right now, during a lot of time during transition is actually when young adults are going into university, and many of you are moving to a different province for school, and that's you know we need to know so that we can help you prepare moving to school, a different new school. Uh, are you starting work? Are you looking into well, not this time getting married, but you know what's happening in your family? Are you have girlfriend, boyfriend? Because that's uh, when we talk about other issues such as sexualities, you know, uh, pregnancies, um, things like that. Um, what are your aspirations? What do you want to be in the future? Now, in terms of expect your expectation for me, what you should know that I can do for you is I should connect you with your pediatric team. So making sure that I get the right information from your pediatric colleagues, from, from our pediatric colleagues respond to your questions and concern. That's why I say, you know, ask questions, always ask questions, we will answer you. Um, and then uh, try to connect with you all the time. And so have the best way to connect with you, either through text, email, you know, phone call. Uh, in terms of how to manage you medically, um, I will review necessary information. I will treat you and I will, you know, provide you ongoing monitoring and if need to, uh, connect you with new therapy, for example, clinical trial. Now, in terms of non-IBD related, if I'm not 
capable of helping you with other things for, such as you know psychology dietitians psycho you know psychiatrists i will try to connect you with other specialists that's needed and then connect with your family doctor because in a adult medical system your family doctor is the backbone of everything they link you to various different specialists and they help you uh you know with most necessary uh primary care uh, issues now in terms of life in general um most important thing for us in the beginning of transition is support your you know life and career decisions and if you're entering post-secondary uh training uh, one thing that I see a lot is making sure that you get your accessibility applications. And I think we can talk about it a little bit later. Um, many universities have um, access, access in um, a diversity de 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 uh, department where they can uh, provide you time and knowing the fact that you have chronic disease, they can provide assistance and time for you, um, you know, for examinations, for uh, paper, for projects, for work, school attendance, uh, they can give you support. And so during the times of flare that you need to be hospitalized or during the times of flare that, you know, you need to have time um, delayed in handing your assignments, uh, that's uh, allowed and that's not going to be, you know, punishment for you in terms of your grades or your your application to your future career now also um, like in general we will try to connect you with other health uh, ally health uh, uh, providers dietitian psychology things like that so in terms of how to help us and help you transition uh, smoothly so when you're under still under pediatric team so when you're still at children's hospital um, important to learn about your disease, review your disease, your medical and surgical history, and again, understanding, understand your flare symptoms. So know when to contact and when this is important. So when your flare is starting, you need to let us know so we can uh, treat you uh, ASAP. And one important thing is that will involve also your parents. Try to practice 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 a year before you come to see us meeting the healthcare professional alone so see your gi alone filling your prescription figure out how to best fill your prescription and letting us know that your prescription is running out so we can help you with that uh, <clears throat> contact us when you have flares so contact your uh, uh you know pediatric gi team when you have flare and know when to do and how to do your monitor uh, uh tests and then take control very slowly no one is expecting you to be able to do all that all at once but slowly take on the task and ultimately become you know looking after your own care now during the time of transition um our recommendation from the consensus that you know adult gi that are receiving you know um ibd patient transition from pediatric care the longest time to take over care and get to know get to see you is six months so for sure, the fact we we those that are receiving care will prioritize getting you over as soon as possible. But during that period of time, continue to monitor your symptoms, continue to adhere to ongoing therapy. And if you are having symptoms, go back to the pediat pediatric teams or alert your receiving um, adult GI that you're having some symptoms. Now, when you've gone over to the adult care, what we would usually do in the first meeting or the first few meetings is to review uh, your goals with you. So what are our goals in terms of this, uh, you know, um, medical alliance? What, what should we try to achieve? What are your disease? What are the therapy? Is there any adjustment that should be done? Or are you doing great? We can move along. Um, and then continue to, I we will continue to uh, increase your responsibility. And that was also with your help of your parents or your guardians, you know, trying to let go slowly. Um, and then continue to alert your teams of the concerns that you have, okay? Um, so, so what we are working on, and there's still a lot of work we need to do for transitions. Uh, what we're working on is to have a, you know, um, multifaceted approach for transition. And Dr. Uh, Eric Ventrimo, myself, and Dr. Natasha Bologiala are working on a prospective trial with 
supports our Crohn's and Colitis Canada to try to improve transition with knowledge, skills, and then actually see if the transition navigator will help us making this process better. Uh, we're also trying to standardize communication between pediatric and adult teens. So trying to set up a proper checklist, proper transfer of information. And then what we're trying to do is actually set up networks of specialists across the country who have special interests to look after young adults like you. Uh, so GI surgeons and other specialists. And so that we are all on the same page. We all understand the importance of looking after you and um, minimize you know, differences between the cares that you receive. And moving forward, we'll continue to receive, you know, get feedbacks from you, from uh, other key stakeholder and continue to show, you know, promote awareness and raise funds. So um, I think this comes to my, the end of my presentations. Um, so any questions or we can kind of have discussion at the end. I'm going to stop sharing. There we go. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Fu. That was uh, a great, great talk. A uh, lot of information. I have a lot of questions myself, um, but I think the, the plan for now, I think, is to move to uh, Austin. Austin. Yeah. yeah. So uh, Austin is going to give a, a, another a brief presentation. Uh, first, I will introduce him. Um, so Austin, pause. Uh, so, sorry. Like my screen is being changed. All right. The same everything happens for a reason resonates with Austin. After a two week stay at the hospital for sick children, Austin learned that he had Crohn's disease and receiving the diagnosis reaffirmed his decision to pursue a career in medicine. In fact, he's striving to become a gastroenterologist. His interest in the field and desire to support young adults motivated Austin to become a patient partner uh, for a project led by Dr. Dean Tripp at Queen's University that investigates the relationship between mental health and IDD in adolescents. While staying on top of his coursework for his undergraduate uh, degree in health sciences and biology at Western University, Austin also supports fellow Mustangs as a member of the Student Engagement and Advocacy Committee. His impact extends beyond the halls of Western as he took the in initiative to establish the Young Adult Community for Crohn's and Colitis, or YAC, uh, to empower youth as they transition to adult care and sits on the committee of Crohn's and Colitis Canada's Young Adult Series. Uh, so I've had the pleasure of working with Austin for two years now, and uh, he's one of those people that you know has promised to be uh, a leader in the field. So welcome, Austin. Thank you very much, Peter, for the introduction. And uh, I just want to first uh, start off uh, by saying thank you to the the Gray Lee family for uh, just allowing me to share my story and uh, come together as a community. Um, so a little about myself. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, a little about myself. Um, as Peter said, I was diagnosed uh, with Crohn's disease uh, in 2019 when I was 16. Uh, this uh, news uh, shortly came after the following the death of my grandfather, who you see in the, the photo to, uh, to your right. Uh, my grandfather was my biggest supporter, and uh, just uh, losing him during uh, uh, the time when I was sick was uh, very hard, and uh, it did cause a flare-up. Um, but it's ultimately what uh, started my journey uh, with uh, GI and uh, wanting to pursue uh, medicine. Um, so I am currently an honor specialization uh, in health science with biology student at Western University. I'm going into my second year. Um, and I am very fortunate to announce that I was uh, one of this year's uh, 2021 Abbey B scholarship recipients. And um, I have now been a Crohn's Clays, on, uh, Crohn's Clays Canada volunteer for over two years. And um, uh, it's been a wonderful journey. I've met uh, amazing people. And I do encourage you, if you have the time, to uh, just try to help out, be a volunteer, because uh, it has helped me on my road recovery. And um, uh, as uh, in my introduction, uh, Peter uh, said, um, I'm one of the co-founders of YAC, which is a community tailored to bringing uh, young adults with IBD uh, together. So I do um, recommend just giving uh, that a look because uh, that too has helped me a lot. Um, next slide, please. So just uh, my experiences uh, from transitioning uh, from pediatric to adult care. Um, I was very fortunate to be under the care of uh, Krista and Karen, 
um, at Sick Kids Hospital GI Pediatrics. Um, after I turned 18, I was uh, sent to McMaster GI Clinic. And um, it really went from Sick Kids uh, Pediatrics holding my hand through every single step of the way to getting thrown out to the sea all by myself. Um, there was a lot of questions being asked and I was very worrisome. And uh, I am still going through the process and uh, has taught me a lot. Um, but uh, some of the few highlights, like things that helped me was uh, practicing making appointments by myself. I am a big introvert, or I was a big in introvert and uh, I still do get nervous talking to people. So I did practice making phone calls and I still do it. Um, just uh, tried to uh, build a better foundation for my communication skills, which does uh, help. Um, and the second thing is ask many questions. Uh, everyone is there to help you and nobody's fighting against you. Um, the more questions you ask, the better understanding that you develop. And uh, that has really helped me. Um, again, by asking questions, I was, learning, I was uh, able to learn more about my disease and to uh, help better myself and help prepare myself for what comes ahead and my journey with IBD. Um, I'd like to note uh, the third point there is uh, do not get discouraged. Uh, it will be difficult at times. I have found myself uh, fatigued very often and uh, I do want to throw in the towel here and there, but um, it is a journey and every journey has its uh, road bumps. And um, yeah, so do not get discouraged. Um, as it would be difficult at times. Uh, next slide, please. So seeking accommodations, uh, both in the school academic setting and uh, workplace setting. Um, just before I talk about the academic uh, and workplace accommodations, I'd like to note that um, always try to remember to put your health first before school and work. Um, so when I was uh, discharged from the Sick Kids Hospital about uh, the two weeks day, so it was about uh, June, and I was in grade 11, so I had my exams uh, coming up. My dad and I thought it was a perfect idea for me to try to get back in it. And uh, I ended up going back to school, I want to say about uh, 10 to 20 days after. And I quickly learned that I couldn't, and I developed another flare-up and I ultimately had to pull out of my grade 11 year. Um, I know it's difficult at times trying to find your new normal, but it's always important that having a chronic illness, you have to learn how to put your health first, no matter what. Um, it was very important, and that's something that I have to still learn today. Um, with the course load I have, I tend to always try to get it done and then put my health aside, and that's not how it works, and it, it is a lifelong process. So just uh, seeking accommodations, uh, the high school accommodations I had, uh, so an indiv individual education plan is where your high school uh, counselors, your high school teachers, your high school admin, and yourself and your family work together to create a support system within your school to provide necessary accommodations. So this has really helped, this really helped me when I was in high school um, because it just was there so I could rely on. And uh, there was times where I had to take weeks off and just to have accommodations like extra time and personal test taking rooms just uh, allowed me to ease into finding that again, that new normal. And uh, that really helped me. Um, and it really set me up for university and college accommodation. So it was actually a peer moderator who told me my first week of school uh, to talk to and seek to out uh, help from my uh, my accommodation counselor. Um, so uh, usually universities and colleges have a range of accommodations to help people with IBD. And um, again, there is no shame in needing to apply for them as they're there to help you as a support system. Um, I had many friends uh, that I've met through the community, uh, IBD community that are too afraid just because they feel like they'll be singled out. Um, what is very important to know is that your, all your information is confidential and that it's, it is really helpful to level the playing field as that's what accommodations are used for. Um, so just if you haven't yet, uh, I would recommend trying to reach out to 
your university's accommodation counselors. So work out uh, some accommodations that can help put your uh, health first. And some of my accommodations, similar to high school, like uh, exam time, personal note taking, exam break. But the one thing that has really helped me and uh, the final stretch of uh, my first year undergrad was um, leniency on assignment. Um, I did almost burn out and just having the just the understanding from my professors was uh, a lot of help. And I could work at my own pace to both help my physical and mental health. As uh, my mental health, I learned that I just have to take care as the same effect of my physical health. Um, next slide, please. So seeking accommodations with work is uh, very subjective because we all know that every workplace is different, every employer is different. Um, so I just added a couple points here um, just to really generalize it. Uh, so the first one is contact your employer, but it's, it, you, uh, it is ultimately in how comfortable you are with disclosing any of your personal information. You don't have to, and it is definitely your choice, um, but it might ease relations and uh, develop a better understanding between your employer and you. Um, so if any slay ups do result and come up, then it is there and you both have an understanding on how to come together and uh, find a resolution. Um, and the second one is if you are comfortable again, disclosing your IBD on your resume, it might help you with your future employer down the road once you can accommodation in the workplace. Um, just again, to develop an understanding is important with communication as uh, communication is again, as noted in the previous uh, presentation, it's very important. Um, and just want to note again, these are suggestions and uh, every situation is different. Um, next slide, please. This is my favorite part. Um, it's just self-advocacy and uh, increasing how to increase your own autonomy. Um, this is, has become honestly what I want to pursue my life's work in uh, alongside GI is to just increase uh, self-advocacy uh, within the IBD community and any chronic community in general. So these are some things I wish I knew uh, going into it. Um, is, uh, the first one is being proactive. Transitioning from pediatric care to adult care is tough and uh, it is a huge leap. Um, parents are not always there uh, all the time to make your appointments and stay off top of things. Uh, I did learn that the hard way. Okay. Um, my parent mom was uh, the helicopter mom, but uh, she did a lot for me and I was very thankful for that. But it was my turn to uh, learn to take care of myself. And uh, during my grade 12 year, I really learned how to uh, learn about my disease, my medication to the point where I was comfortable uh, doing that all by myself and talking to my specialist all by myself. Um, and the second point is being your own advocate. Um, having an, an invisible chronic illness is tough. And some people will dismiss it and feel that you're only seeking attention. I did face this in my grade 11 and here, as my vice principal wanted to me to take my exam uh, two weeks after I got discharged, which is was one of the reasons why I wanted to get back to school and start learning and being in the uh, classroom again. And uh, it ultimately came out she thought I was seeking attention, and. Uh, this, this also was a big uh, learning and uh, milestone for me because I learned how to step up for myself and uh, uh, make myself heard. And uh, with the help of uh, Krista from Sick Kids, I was able to uh, come to a, um, a fine understanding between my school and uh, my chronic illness. And uh, that has really helped me. And I still apply those same principles and help advocate for what I need and what, uh, what to do so I can be successful, both academically and uh, uh, the third one is be responsible. Um, when in adult care, there's a lot of appointment times and medication to remember and uh, a lot more to keep track of. And uh, that's on top of what you, your daily life and what you have to do. So it's your own job to take charge and be on top of things. Um, for instance, uh, tomorrow I have uh, two appointments and one appoint another appointment got switched on to uh, that uh, tomorrow and uh, I had to uh, um, just learn how to take things into my own consideration and uh, learn how to accept that uh, I had to cancel uh, 
uh, very late and uh, just taking responsibility for my own action. And the uh, fourth one, which is by far my favorite, is uh, to get involved. Uh, part of managing my own IBD is uh, being a part of a bigger community that helps me feel not alone. A problem that I really faced uh, during my uh, high school uh, academics and my university academics today is that I feel lonely at times. I feel isolated. And uh, just being a part of an IBD community and being able to relate to people has not only helped me feel heard and uh, feel wanted, but it has also helped my health dramatically. And um, I always believe in this paper that I re uh, read in uh, first year uh, health science is that uh, the altruism born in suffering is all about uh, trying to help other people by uh, uh, talking about and reliving your own experiences. And uh, I really live by that. Um, I tried to find other ways that meant through research and through um, just being a mentor to other people uh, really helped me and uh, really helped my health. So, um, and it, the, the, the bonus and big benefit is uh, when you're a bigger community, you have a collective voice and uh, it's easier to advocate. And uh, that's one thing at YAC that we really wanted to do is to be an advocate for others, but be an advocate together ultimately. Um, and that uh, concludes my presentation. Yeah, thank you so much, Austin. Uh, when I said that I, I, I thought that you'd be a leader in the field, this is why uh, I think you covered things really well, comprehensively, and uh, so many things resonated. I found, I think on your first slide about uh, um, it being like you're being tossed into the sea uh, and the whole transition process. Yeah, that described things for me too. Um, okay, so uh, to get started with questions, uh, I know that from the, uh, I guess the registration forms, uh, there were quite a number of questions related to finding a good gastroenterologist. So as you make the transition from pediatric care to finding your own doctor, how do you, how do you pick a good one? Um, I think it's a tough, tough questions, but uh, we were, tr we're trying to make it easy. And that's why um, what we're doing right now is to create a network of um, GIs that are um, interested in IBD transitions. And so that hopefully, uh, you know, con connecting with Crohn's and Colitis Canada, that we're able to have sort of a map. Um, all these GIs across the country that are interested in looking after young adults uh, transitioning. Now, um, this is in, in the process and it works. And I think what's important, and, and the, this came up um, in a conversation with our pediatric colleague, because um, unfortunately, the, although we're all in GI, we don't have a lot of cross paths. So not at all about uh, a pediatric GI knows the adult GI. And so um, I think one thing to think about when you're picking a uh, adult GI is really talk to your um, talk to your pediatric uh, um, GI, and then also like what Yak and what CCC is doing is go back to the patient group and say, hey, you know, who's your GI? Is there one that you're recommending? You know, who do you think may fit well for me? And that. You know, and then bring it back to our pediatric uh, 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 team and see if you can be referred there. Now, we are starting to have a specialized center across the country that uh, look after IPD patients. So, uh, you know, in BC, Calgary, Toronto, McMaster, we have specialized uh, adult team that are taking on uh, IBD patients that are young adults. And so those are the centers that you might want to be moved over to as well because there was, it will be a good uh, time to, at least you're not thrown into the sea, you're still being handheld for a little bit until you get your skill back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, I guess relatedly, maybe a little bit outside the, the transition phase, um, say you're, you're, you have transitioned, you've been with an adult doctor for a period of time. I've, I've had the experience of hearing from others uh, that they, they either lost that click or, or something happened that tarnished the relationship and they didn't feel comfortable going back to that doctor. Anymore. And um, that's, you know, that's not uncommon, to be honest. Um, you know, relationship change. Um, and that is, we as a overall IBD community, um, you know, um, we are happy to look after patients from one another, to be honest, right? So it's not, um, how should I say this? It's not 
a problem looking for a second opinion. And in this, you know, a lot of time going back, and that's why it's important to have your, a family doctor who might be able to say like, hey, maybe you can, we can get you to see this other GI to see what their thoughts are. And many of us, uh, we also send to our colleague, um, you know, other gastroenterologists and say, hey, do you mind looking after this patients? Maybe they will be a good fit for you. So we have no, no concerns of having patient move around at all, at all. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like there is this impression that there's uh, maybe a stigma with wanting to uh, see a different doctor um, no. that might be a barrier for patients. So it's good to hear that mm -hmm. uh, from, from you that it's not. I mean, most um, importantly, at least well for me, is that my patient is receiving the best care. So if there are something that I cannot support and it's something that I cannot do with some people, you know, some patient that may be best treated with um, other specialties or, you know, um, um, requiring clinical trials, please, you know, look after my patients. As long as my patients are healthy, that's, that's the best. That's the most important. Yeah. Uh, great. Uh, to switch uh, over to Austin for a second. Um, one question that, that I've had, and I'm curious, uh, I, I haven't talked to somebody to hear what, it, what sort of goes through your mind when you make the decision to reach out to the, um, I guess, Access and Diversity or the Center for Students with Disabilities, that sort of thing. Like what, what's the tipping point in your mind? Um, there luckily wasn't uh, too much of a tipping point. So uh, it was a great recommendation from yourself to get it started right away. Um, but uh, the reason why I knew I needed it uh, was during the third week, I believe, of my lecture. So I was in a biology uh, lab and um, I didn't feel like getting out of bed. Uh, I had horrible fatigue and uh, I was experiencing that fatigue uh, throughout that week. And I kind of dismissed it just saying it was a uh, part of student life. But um, I saw all of my other classmates uh, partying and here and there, like do doing their own thing. Uh, um, and uh, I still couldn't get out of bed. And uh, I did more asking and I asked questions. Uh, and uh, it was uh, concluded that it was part of my Crohn's disease. And uh, that's when I knew that uh, really accessing, accessing and uh, using my accommodations were there to benefit me and to help me manage that stress. Um, I was a workaholic and uh, now I better managed uh, that uh, I have to focus on my mental and physical health a little bit more. So that, that, was, that was more realizing that uh, the accommodations were there to help me and level the playing field. Great, okay, thank you. Um, I, we, we got a question from, uh, I guess, the audience. Uh, what, uh, for Austin, uh, what kinds of mental health activities or things did you find most useful? Um, I like to read, and I already know that that sounds totally insane uh, due to all the reading I have to do. I, I think this week I've read at least four papers and uh, like a few chapters, but uh, just on my own uh, feature reading. And uh, I love hiking, and I'll do that. And um, I still use uh, Dr. Sarah Alcahut's um, uh, mental health preparation and activity from last uh uh, last year, which has really helped me. And uh, I also focused on deep breathing just before uh, bed. And uh, those, those couple things has really helped me through mental health uh, and taking care of it. Um, and I'm really happy you actually asked that question as uh, it was something I really need to work on after my uh, getting diagnosed and after my granddad's death um, was to prepare myself more mentally to get out. And, uh, um, be fully functioning again. So yeah, those are some of the few activities that uh, has really helped me during this process. Yeah, it's a diverse number of things, uh, reading, getting out in nature, and uh, being active, for sure, yeah. Um, uh, Dr. Fu, uh, question was, um, first, I was more interested in, I was interested in hearing more about the uh, transition trial that mm -hmm. you and Dr. Benchmal and uh, the other individual was a part of. And if there was something that we could do as patients to help you, uh, I guess, make a bigger impact or succeed. 
Um, thank you for asking that question. Actually, it's very important. I think Yak um, and maybe Claudia that's on the, the group here, um, we are uh, hopefully eventually will involve uh, Yak as well um, to be uh, our um, um, patient's uh, voice. And so that your voice is definitely um, part of this overall uh, transition trials moving forward, you'll be um, a checkpoint for our uh, educational module, you know, skill building modules, uh, our knowledge. And so and that all all aspect of this will need your stamp of approval uh, so that we can move forward, move forward. So right now we're in a process of uh, building the, the foundations and building the modules. And so once that is set, uh, we will uh, move over to you guys and for you to give us um, uh, your your thoughts. And then, then before we wrote it out uh, to real life. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it, it just sounds like such a good idea. Like if we could clone you and uh, <laughs> there could be more, I guess, gastroenterologists that have that focus and are, um, you know. I and I think that's, great. Well, that's what we're trying to do because this is a topic that you know has been somewhat uh, not not highlighted, and and that's why you know we're here and uh, trying to promote awareness. And thank you for you know setting up you know Yak so that you know uh, youth in Canada can connect with each other and you know um, share their experiences because we have kids camp. But once they move out of, you know, pedi pediatric, there isn't such things for young adults to connect with each other. So thank you for doing that as well. Okay, uh, I just want to, I guess, plug to the audience. If, if you have any more questions, uh, feel free to, don't be shy, feel free to ask uh, if any of your burning questions um, or, or from the, the committee as well. Uh, I'd be curious if you have any questions as well. I would just ask a question um, about uh, COVID and uh, accessing accommodations in the school workplace. Um, luckily, uh, a lot of the, uh, the accommodations that you do receive uh, in school, like the personal notes taking leniency on assignments um, and et cetera, are like they cover a lot of uh, what they would give you for uh, COVID, COVID accommodations. Uh, so, for instance, uh, I can uh, take all my lectures at the at my apartment, and uh, because they're all recorded, uh, both the audio file and uh, the slides. Uh, so, if that's something you're more comfortable with, uh, uh, if not, I mean, like myself, uh, just being at home, uh, not surrounded by 700 people in a lecture hall, um, that's something for you. But uh, ultimately, it comes down to uh, your academic counselors and your accommodation counselors and uh, yourself and what uh, uh, you come to. So I just wanted to answer that question really quickly. And I, I want to plug back to, you know, uh, very important for all young adults attending high school, secondary, post-secondary to definitely access um, the access and accommodation just because you don't know if you're going to flare, you don't know when you're going to, um, you know, use them. And just so that they know you, it's there is no shame whatsoever uh, to be connected with them and you know they're there to help you yeah and from my experience uh like there are a number of benefits that you might not really think of immediately uh one is to, to get it uh to be proactive uh, just in case you do flare up later on you don't want to have to add that stress on to the other stresses that you're gonna have to deal with the other i i found um like i would go to each of my professors with a little form to get them to sign it and it was a really good excuse to sort of get to know them and uh, <laughs> make, a, make a connection that way. So if you ever had questions or wanted to go to office hours or whatever later, you had already broken the ice and they knew you, you're a familiar face. So that was useful too. Um, and then the third, I, I think that sort of ties uh, a lot of the things that were discussed together today um, is uh, the, the act of taking ownership of your health and everything that's involved being responsible for your health. Uh, there are so many little micro skills that are translatable that you can use anywhere else that will help you with your studies, uh, with other jobs and uh, just everything else in your future. So being uh, having the courage to, uh, if you're introverted, to, to reach out to others and ask for help and uh, ask for information, that sort of thing, it's, it's all very useful. 
um, yeah, so that's just what I wanted to add on to that. Yeah, and uh, Claudia is, uh, I guess, agreeing with me. So let's uh, make a message in the chat. Um, yes, uh, if, if there are no other questions, if you had anything else that you'd like to, um, to share, any other message? Maybe I'll start. I just want to say thank you, everyone, for this event. And I think uh, moving forward, the future is bright. And I think people are uh, noticing and understanding that you know, young adult uh, with IBD uh, is a special group that we need to um, uh, focus on. And I think this is great. OK, thank you so much to, to both of you for, for lending your time out of your very busy schedules. Um, if the, if anybody has any questions, uh, Jackie just sent a, a message, uh, and here it is on the screen. Um, uh, you can send your questions to research at crimsonquitis.ta, uh, and we will, uh, just get back to you and try to answer them for you. Um, and, uh, I guess to wrap up this evening, uh, there is a survey that you're invited to complete. You can scan the QR code or go to the link at the bottom. Uh, if you have any ideas to, uh, uh, or just feedback in general to, to share with us. Uh, it's all appreciated and we can use it to improve uh, next year. And Kate is uh, just sent another message. There's a research program that is developing resources to help you at work communicate with your employer, which I think is a bit of a, uh, uh, I guess, a gap from what I've, I've uh, been aware of. Um, the accommodations at universities are generally really good, um, but it's, a, it's another story for your employers because they're all so different. So I guess uh, it, this looks like a good resource to check out. Okay, um, and then just before we sign off, uh, uh, plug for next week, uh, we'll be inviting uh, Olympic, uh, Canadian Olympic uh, athlete, John uh, Smith, uh, and uh, we'll have a peer support session and that's on September 22nd. And uh, another reminder to complete those waivers and get those submitted. Uh, so again, thank you uh, both uh, Dr. Fu and Austin for uh, sharing your time. And uh, I guess until next week, uh, enjoy your night. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night. Bye. Thank you very much.